Oh, we made it to the last chapter. Yay. One to go. So only, what, three more days, I think. Of we have this test, and we have the final exam. So chapter 11 and the final exam. Uh, next week, I'll have your review packet for your final exam. I'll get that to you. So you'll have that to start, start working on. There is also um, a review that is in Hawks as well. And I don't have that posted yet, but I'll get it posted so that you can have that too. So you can do it right in um, Hawks as well. So, so, but we're down to chapter 11. And um, so let's... Uh, See what we can do with chapter 11. The first two sections are dealing with functions. Then we get into um, logarithms, and um, we get to see what we can do with those. This chapter usually isn't too bad. It's fairly straightforward and fairly easy after some of them, some sections that we've had in here. So let's get on and move into um, 11. So 11.1 .1 is looking at algebraic functions. And what functions are, we're going to take and find the sum. So we're going to add them, the difference, or subtract them. We're going to multiply them. And we're going to find out what the quotient of the two functions happens to be. And so and then we're going to graph sum of two functions. So we're going to see what happens if we add these functions together. And then use your graphing calculator to take a look at some of these functions that have two pieces to them and see what happens at that point. So the algebraic operations, we're going to start out with two functions, such as an f of x and a g of x. That's going to represent our two functions. And x is the value of the domain of both functions. So domains come in here again. There's a couple places we have to be careful with, with domains, and that is radicals, um, where we have denominators that have a value in it that can never be zero because that makes it undefined. We have um, radical or um, the square roots and the cube roots. And square roots especially are any even root where we can never have zero underneath it or anything, or zero, we can have zero, but we can't have anything negative under there. So we gotta be aware of those type of things. So what are these gonna look like? So if we got the sum of two functions, it's going to look as f plus g, meaning that we're just going to take whatever f happens to be and whatever g happens to be, and based on what x is, we're going to add them all together and find out what they're going to combine to be. So it's kind of like going back through and doing some of the basic algebra stuff where we're just combining like terms, but it's just another way of looking at it. So the process is there. Difference, we're going to subtract them in here. So we're going to take them and and change the sign of the g values. And products, we're going to do is FOIL maybe because they might be two binomials or they might have to have a distribution of a number or a letter times something in there. And then finally, we're going to do the quotients. Now when we get into quotients, we have to be real careful that this piece at the bottom never equals zero. So we're going to look at that for a domain and say what pieces can't we ever have with that. So these are kind of the, the main things with our operations within our functions. So what do they look like? Well, we're going to work with this, these two functions. And in your Hawks, when you work with it, they will always give you two functions. You will have that. It'll be written somewhere up above. It won't be that you'll just have um, f of x and g of x. Yeah, let me get this ladybug out of here. Yeah, down here. There we go. Um, and they, they'll always give you that. So then you look within your description of what you need to do. This says I'm going to take f and I'm going to add g to it. So what that means is I'm going to have 3x squared plus x minus 4, plus x minus 6. So our mathematical process with this is pretty straightforward because all I need to do is combine like terms. Well, there's no other x squared, so I get 3x squared. I have 1x and another x, so that gives me 2x. I have a minus 4 and a minus 6, and that gives me a minus 10. So what I have done is I've taken those two things and added them together 
to see what they ended up equaling. So again, just basic algebra skills. And the basic algebra skills we have in here is just combining like terms. Do I have any limits on this? Does x have any limits? Does my domain have any limits? And we found when we looked at parabolas, because that's what this will come out to be, because it's a quadratic, we didn't have any limits on x. X could be anything that I wanted to plug in there, because again, it doesn't make anything happen to that. So that's what happens to this one. And then the next one, it says to subtract these two. So f of x is equal to 3x squared plus x minus 4. And g of x is equal to x minus 6. So we have to have those two. So we can end up doing what we have to do here. So this says f minus g. Now if it had g minus f, we would have to be real careful and make sure that you put your g part first and your f part second. So what this means is I got 3x squared plus x minus 4 minus x minus 6. The difference between this one and the adding one is that when I get to the subtraction piece, I need to change my signs. So the x is going to become negative. The negative 6 is going to become positive. And what happens when I put those together is 3x squared doesn't have anybody to go with it. A positive x and a negative x, long gone. A negative 4 and a positive 6 just leaves me with a positive 2. So notice this changed from what it was when I added it. It became something completely different um, as I worked through that. So be careful with those. Last, last one here is f times g, and we're still looking in relationship to x. Now sometimes there will be a number that will be put into that place, and you'd work out your number and work out your numerical values. So what this one means is I have 3x squared plus x minus 4 times x minus 6. So I need to distribute and give everything in here an x. So 3x squared times x. So it's, getting, it's pulling back all of those basic algebra skills. x times x is an x squared. x times a negative 4 is negative 4x. Then I need to multiply everybody by a negative 6. So negative 6 times 3x squared is a negative 18x squared. Negative 6 times x is a minus 6x. Negative 6 times a negative 4 is a plus 24. And now I can take these and combine like terms. Get 3x squared minus 17x squared minus 10x plus 24. So it's kind of just an exercise of pulling all your stuff back together. And if we had d, and we'll add d in here, which is f over g, Sure, I didn't stick that one on the next page. Nope. <clears throat> um, of x. That just means I would have 3x squared plus x minus 4 all over x minus 6. And then you would have to go back and take a look and see if this could be factored and if any cancellations could be done. This is not going to factor out. You'll never get an x minus 6 out of it. So therefore, it's as far as we can possibly go with it. And we'll have another one in here that we can probably do that with. Questions on doing these at all? They're pretty straightforward. It's just always pay attention to what they give you and what your values would be um, for those. And so you want to, to watch for that. So then this piece says what will happen if x equals 2? What would my values and what would my answers be if I had to substitute in a 2 in place of my numbers. I'm going to find a different color pen here, and we'll go back and do that. So if it says x equals 2, and how you would see these is f plus x, or plus g, and you'll have a 2 out here. And that 2 means that when I get done solving this, I would plug a 2 in wherever x happens to be, and come up with what its solutions would be. So let's go back here, and we will see what we can do with these in order to get what the value would be with 2. So take your answer that you've combined, like I have here, and we're going to plug 2 into it. So I'm going to have 3 times 2 squared plus 2 times 2 minus 10 
2 squared is 4, 4 times 3 is 12, 2 times 2 is 4, minus 10, so 12 plus 4 is 16, 16 minus 10, I will find out that my answer is 6. So what I have found is a point, basically, of 2 comma 6 when I added these two found functions together. We'll look at it on your graphing calculator in a little bit, and then you can see what happens <clears throat> when we get points with all of these. So the math in this isn't too tough. It's pretty straightforward. Um, so that's what happens with this one. So then if we go over here to this one, and I'm going to go with my answer again that I found, plug 2 into it. So 2 times 2 is 4 times 3 is 12. 12 plus 2 equals 14. So my point combination with this one would be 214 if I were subtracting my two functions. You good? What do you guys think? Plugging two in works. And then down here at the bottom, I kind of ran out of space here, three times two squared minus seven, or cubed, I should say. This is a cube up here. 17 times two squared minus 10 times two plus 24. Two cubed is eight. Eight times three is 24. Two squared is four. Four times 17. That one in my head, I'll probably mess it up. Is 34. Oh no, wait, wait, wait. 17 times 4. I was going to say 68. There we go. 2 times a negative 10 is a negative 20 plus 24. So if I take all of these and put them together, 24 from 68 leaves me with 44. 44 and a negative 20 is a negative 64. Negative 64 and a plus 24 is going to give me um, 40. Negative. So I get a negative 40 out of that. Okay? Does that make sense? Okay. And then finally the division, I would have 3 times 2 squared plus 2 minus 4 all over... 2 minus 6. 2 times 2 is 4. <clears throat> times 3 is 12. And um, 2, oh, so 12 plus 2 minus 4. So um, 12 plus 2 is 14, minus 4 is 10. Or I end up with a negative 10 fourths or a negative 5 halves when I reduce it. So that is what we do with those. Okay, so questions with that part? What do you think? Think we're good? Okay. Um, now, sometimes these end up um, giving you a square in there. So if these two are my following functions, um, we're going to find out what happens if I add these together. So if I add them together, f plus g, um, at x, then again, same thing. I don't know how many times we need to do this to get you to understand what we need to do because it's pretty straightforward stuff. So if I add them together, I get x squared plus x plus 1, and that becomes my answer. Okay? So that's what I would end up doing with this one. So they'd end up being that for my, for my final answer. To this one. And then if we take these and write them over here, we are going to subtract the 2. So if I subtract the 2, um, and it's notice it's g minus f, so it's 2x plus 1 minus x squared minus x. So I changed my order in here, so do pay attention to that. So 2x minus 1, um, or plus 1, minus x squared, plus x. So I get a negative x squared, 2x, and, or 3x, or 2x, yes, this is a 2. 2x and an x is 
3x, and so that becomes my solution. Okay? What do you think? And then the last one, f divided by g, so x squared minus x, all over 2x plus 1. Um, I can factor out an x in the top, but it's not going to help me. And nothing cancels in there. So sometimes they do cancel. So do be aware that you do have to factor them at this point to see what comes out of them. Okay? What do you guys think? Okay. And um, then, so that was this piece. And then it says, what do they equal for A through C? if x were 3. So I would need to go back and plug a 3 in. So let's do that. So I'd have 3 squared plus 3 plus 1. So 9 plus 3 plus 1. 9 plus 3 is 12 plus 1 is 13. <clears throat> so it's just sticking 3 back in after you have added those things together or subtracted them. Here, if I put a 3 in, I get 3 squared is 9, but it's going to be a negative 9, plus 3 times 3 is 9. So that one comes out to be 0, which is fine. And then this one down here, and another thing, this is limited on what its domain can be, because I could not stick anything in here, 2x plus 1 equals 0, we did that a while back, if I minus 1, divide by 2, I find x can never, ever equal a negative 1 half. So I would have to limit my domain so it could not equal that. Um, but back to putting my 3 in, so 3 squared minus 3 over 2 times 3 plus 1. 3 times 3 is 9, minus 3 is 6. 2 times 3 is 6. Plus 1 is 7, so I end up with 6 sevenths. Mm -hmm. Where does the, what was that? Oh, okay. Um, it should be here. Thank you for saying that. You should have caught me when I did it the first time. The plus 1 needs to be there. And so even up here, I need a plus 1. And so really my answer is, one plus one. So it really should equal one. I ended up misplacing my one. Sorry about that. So that does correct it. So be careful if you're watching this. There should be a one in there because I missed my one at that point. Okay. All right. But you got the idea, do you think, of sticking stuff together, watching your multiplications in there, and um, watching what those things come out to be. Um, when you're working with them. If you've got a radical involved, like this one is, you can't really combine it with stuff. Because if I put these two together with my f of x, I'm going to have x plus 5 plus my radical, which is x minus 2. And so really, my only answer that I can possibly come up with this for this one is that, okay? And am I limited by what I could possibly put in here? Yes, I'm going to be limited because this can never be negative under here. We get imaginary numbers. And so um, I take x minus 2 and set it greater than or equal to 0. So x needs to be greater than or equal to 2. So my domain ends up being limited on this one, okay? So do keep that in mind that, that sometimes you have to be careful with domains and um, what you have that comes out of those. So um, we're going to evaluate this for, let me, for 3. So if I evaluate it for 3, that means over here I'm going to plug in a 3 to this whole thing. So I'm going to have 3 plus 5 plus the square root of 3 minus 2, or I have 3 plus 5 plus the square root of 3 minus 1, or minus 2 is 1, 
So 3 plus 5 plus 1. And so my answer comes out to be 9. Or, remember when we take the square root of this, it could be a plus or minus. But I'm going to add it in here because they're always telling me to add it. And it could also have been 7. Although, um, you probably won't have to do that to find both answers. It's just the one that you would end up needing for those. Okay? Does that make sense? You had enough of these, do you think? I think you get into doing um, a lot of those and um, coming up with what they would end up being. This one's F divided by G. And so if we got F divided by G, um, my F of X was X plus 5. My g of x was the square root of x minus 2. And so if I plug those in, I'm just going to simply have x plus 5 all over the square root of x minus 2. And when I do that, again, my denominator limits this. So I can never have x can never be greater than or equal to 2 as we had found before. So we have to limit that. So when you're looking at this thing, it changes your domain. So your domain needs to be things that are greater than or equal to 2. So I cannot have anything that's less than this. I guess I should put less than in there. I can't have anything less than 2. So be real careful if they ask you about domains and what you happen to have with those. And um, that's the important piece with this one. Okay. All right. Um, the next piece in here um, is that we need to add these functions together. And this is always adding. So this is always adding. And what they do with my adding is they give me points. So what do I know about my points? Well, if you look at each of these points, the x values are the same. Do you see how those match? I have two functions, f of x and g of x. And what I'm doing is I'm combining these together. So what we combine is only the y's. So um, must have the same x. And you're going to add the y values together to get the new point. So if we're taking a function, and we'll show you in a graph in a little bit here, but if you're taking a function and you're sticking that function together, what takes place with it? Well, if we're at threes, this is the same as when we did the functions earlier and we substituted a 3 in or we put the 2 in place. That's what we're doing here, basically. So all I need to do is add my 5 and my 7 together to get my two point. So my new point, 5 plus 7, ends up giving me 12. Then down here at 2, if I add a negative 5 and a positive 4 together, I get a negative 1. My third point, we're at a negative 4. 7 plus 2 is 9. So what I've done is combine those. So if it said adding, I'm adding. If it said subtracting, then what I would do, if it's function f of x, take away g of x, then I would just simply subtract these two and get my new point. So this was addition. If I were subtracting, I would still leave my 3, but then I'd take 5 minus 7 and get a negative 2. The next one, 2, and this is subtraction. A negative 5 minus 4 is really a negative 5 and a negative 4 or a negative 9. And last, a negative 4, 7 minus 2 is 5. So I have combined those based on a point, based on knowing what my point value happens to be. I could end up getting them combined and coming up with what they would be. So in this case, this first one, it was f plus g at, at a point. 
The second one was f minus g at a point. So we had points and relationships to those. Does that make sense? Hopefully. Okay. So again, don't add the threes. You don't come up with six. You come up with just adding the y's together. And so you end up with a new relationship there. So down here, if I had h plus j at a point, what would my answer be? So if I looked at this, negative 3 I'm at, 4 plus a negative 2 is 2, negative 1, 6 plus a negative 4 is also at 2. Then down here, negative, or positive 8 plus a negative 6 is also 2. So what has happened with this thing is that we've gotten those combinations together and came up with what the new values would be for our points. They're all at twos. So I came up with a straight line. So it's kind of interesting how sometimes that happens. These are definitely two different lines, but what they're mere images of each other. And we'll get into converting and coming up with um, what their opposite um, value happens to be in 11.2. But for right now, we're just kind of sticking those pieces together. So then, if we change this up a little bit, and we go J minus H, I have to be careful because it's going the opposite direction in here. So in this one, at a negative 3, a negative 2 minus 4, or a negative 2 plus a negative 4 is a negative 6. Negative 4 minus 6 is a negative 4, and a negative 6 is a negative 10. And last of all, at 0, a negative 6 minus 8, or negative 6 plus a negative 8, is a negative 14. So they come out looking completely different if you're adding or if you're subtracting or whatever you happen to be doing with those. So pay attention if you get one of these and watch what points come up and whether you're adding or subtracting with them. No, it's going J minus H. See how it says J minus H? Oh, now can you see it? <laughs> it's kind of off the screen there. It was J minus H. I switched it so that you had to put J in first and then minus H. So that's why. Okay? Yep. Um, so that's what made our difference in there with those. Easy stuff. It's just taking what you already know and applying it to a new method or applying it to something that's connected with a totally, totally different chapter and a totally different thing that's happening in there. So if we look at these guys, what's going to happen? So if I said um, I want to take F plus G and I have a graph of whatever X happens to be. So just like I did before, let me find another color pen here. I think you got a red one in there. If I can find a different type of pattern in here, I'm going to look for my points just like I did before. This point is at 1, 2, 3, a negative 3, comma, negative 3. This point that matches it on f of, on, uh, that's g of x, this is f of x, and it matches it right here, and that point happens to be at a negative 3 comma 2, and I add those two together, what's going to happen? Negative, or positive 2, plus a negative 3 is going to give me a, two, a new point. Positive 2 plus a negative 3 gives me what? Positive 2 plus a negative 3 gives me a negative 1. So I'm going to put a dot right there. That's my new point, okay? If I take these two and add them together, this one's at uh, 2, and this one's at 0. So 2 plus 0 is 2. Are we following? Okay. Usually what happens is I get lots of, lots of emails when my <coughs> online people get to this because they don't have sometimes the instruction like this going with it. And so they get and say, how in the world are they coming up with these new points? 
So what happens here? This one is at 2, and this one's at 3. So 2 plus 3 gives me 5. So i got to go up at 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. This one here, I'm up at 3. I'm down at a negative 2. So 3 plus a negative 2. 3 plus a negative 2 gives me a positive 1. So what you can see is a new graph forming in here. And that new graph that's forming is the addition or the combination of those two graphs. It's saying I'm putting these two things together so that I get an idea of what's taking place with them. What happens here? 3 plus 2 is back up at 5. 4 plus 2 is up at 6. And finally, the last one is up at 5 plus 0 is still at 5. And so that's my new graph. Okay? So does that hopefully make sense to you? So when it asks you to look for a certain point, that's what they're asking you to do, is say, what is taking place with that? The next one over here is a parabola connected with a straight line. And so what they're going to do is they will show you the graph in Hawks. I'll show you this. And they will give you that. So then you need to look at your graph and find a negative 2, which is here. So there's a negative 2 and X. So what's happening with my Y values at a negative 2? My Y value here is at uh, a positive 2. My Y value here is at 5. So I have 5 plus 2 is equal to 7. Okay? So you just got to locate those so you figure out where your points happen to be. So what's happening at 0? But now I want to take F. This is F. At 0, I'm at 6, but I want a minus G, and at G at 0 is a negative 1. So what would I get? 6 minus a negative 1, or 6 plus 7, or plus 1 is equal to 7 for that one. So all I did was to go locate on my graph where that happens to be, and then I just stick them together and combine them. So this one here? F times, or G times F, so G at 2 is up at 2, times F at 2, and F at 2 is at 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, so my answer becomes 14, okay? What do you think? Not too bad. It's just locating where these points are. Once in a while... <laughs> you might have F at 3 plus G at um, F at 3 and G at a negative 2. What would I end up then with for an answer? So I would find F at 3, here's F, and here's 3, so it's up at 5. G at a negative 2, and why they do this, I am not quite certain, but they do. So I get 5 plus 2 is 7. So that becomes my answer with that one. Okay? So we've moved from basically abstract to looking at concrete type things where we're looking at what the graph has to look like um, for those. And so that's kind of the, the pieces there. So be careful with those and make sure that you get your stuff in there. This next piece is using your graphing calculator to combine these. And so you guys got your graphing calculators, hopefully. Um, to abbreviate what's in here is you're going to enter your two functions is y1 and y2. Okay? So if on here, let me give you an example. So if y1 is x plus 3 and y2 is x squared plus x squared minus 1 
So if this were our two pieces, I'm going to stick those into my calculator. So let's stick those on here. So go to your y equals. Clear out whatever you got in there, if you've got something in there. And we're going to put x plus 3 into y1. Then we're going to go down to y2, and we're going to put x squared minus 1 <clears throat> in there. So we've got a straight line, a straight line of x plus 3, and we have a parabola. <clears throat> so if I hit graph, I'm going to get both of those coming in. So there's my straight line, and there's my parabola. Everybody okay? You got those on there? Okay. So we've got those on there, and so far what we've been doing is we've been adding these things by hand. So I could go to my table, I can go second table, and take these things and stick them together now because I've got all my X's, I have all my Y's, so I could look at this and say, okay, if I'm going to add these two at negative 2, 1 plus 2, or 1 plus 3 is 4, um, 2 plus 0 is 2, 3 plus a negative 1 is 2. So I can go through and combine all these um, without the help of my calculator. But the next piece is we're going to have our calculators help us out with this. So if we do that, we're going to go to our next piece that is go back to my y equals. So everybody there? We're going to go down to y3. And then we're going to press the varies key. And the varies is for the variables, and it sits right here next to your clear button. Everybody find that on their calculator? Okay. So if I hit that button, go over to Y variables. We're going to stay on function. So we're good so far? We're going to hit enter. And then I'm going to select which function I want to do first. So if it said um, f plus g, I would put, of course, my f function first, my g function second. If it said g minus f, then I would put the g function first, where I put it in my y, y values, and my x, or my g, or my h, or my, excuse me, my f function next. So if I stay there, I'm going to put y1 in there first. Then I'm going to tell it what I want it to do. So I want it to add, so I'm going to put a plus sign in there. And then I am going to go and go back and to my varies, to my variable parts, over to y varies, back to function. But now I'm going to select, instead of y1, I'm going to select y2. And so what I have done is I have now taken this whole thing and set it up so I have both of my functions and both of my pieces in there. So what the calculator is going to do for me is going to take all those Y1s and Y2s and add them together and give me another column for my next graph. So if I hit um, my graph up here, it's going to show me my first two, and then it's going to show me my new one. <coughs> So this new piece popping in here, right here, that was the new piece that was added. That's those two added together. So I've taken and created a new graph is what has happened with this. So then if I go to y equals, or not y equals, but to my table, second table, here's my y1 graph. That's my straight line. Here's my parabola. And if I over arrow, there's my Y3 that's added my pieces together, okay? So I can get all of my, my sections together there and come up with whatever I wanted to find in there. So if you are given um, zero and you want to plug zero in and have the two graphs added together, your answer would come up to be three, okay? So if I plugged in zero, I would end up, or two, I should say, I would get a two out of that. If I put in four, I would end up getting um, 22 would be my new added factor. Okay, does that make sense? Hopefully. Okay, now, the neat thing about this is if you're really careful with your calculator 
and never remove line three, Y three, your answers are different. Oh, that's what did it. Mm -hmm. Then it would make them all different because now yours would be, um, yours would be the, the plus in there instead of the, the minus one. Yep. So that would make a difference. But if you're real careful and don't move this out of there, and let's say your next problem, you might have to change your Y1 and your Y2, or it might be the same problem, but now it says subtract them. So now I use change that piece in the center, and now what we'll do is it will subtract all of them. And my graph this time, if I look at the graph piece, there's the first one, there's the second then, that's Y1 and Y2, and look what it did. It flipped my parabola upside down when I combined it and subtracted the two. My other one was up in here when I added the two. This one turned it upside down. Okay. Joanne, did you get it? Okay. Okay. So it just flips it upside down and, and where it has to go. So let me get my calculator out of here if you want to stick this stuff in your notes so that you know how to put that in. This is also in your book. If you want to go to your book, let me find the page number um, in your textbook. These exact same instructions are on page 862. So they're there. So if you want to look them up and you want to know where they're at in your book, that's the page number that they're on. So the instructions are right there to walk you through it of what you need to do. Um, so give you a chance to write that stuff down and and um, see what happens with it. But it does, it just gives you a way of combining these so that you can, if you, you can use this when we plugged in two. Remember when we did all those combining of like values and it said to find out what it was at two? You can do this with it um, because it's going to combine all those. So you can just look at your, at your table and know what happens to it at two um, when you're working with those. So um, just... You know, be aware of that, that it's going to let you do that type of stuff with it. So, okay. Again, if you need to abbreviate some of those things, um, you can abbreviate them too. So, that's pretty straightforward once you get to what you need. And again, you can put in your other process key in here of whatever happens to be, whether it's adding, subtracting, multiplying, or dividing um, with whatever happens to that. So, dividing sometimes come out really strange. Um, and I'll just show you that on this calculator, and we'll put a divide in here. And the reason they do, um, especially when you um, have problems that have a radical involved because there's going to be missing points and missing stuff that comes in there. Notice how that really got really strange because you have a piece that's coming up here you have a piece that's upside down there, and you have a piece that's coming in here. So it got really strange when you do division. In here, there are pieces that you can never use, and that's those points that show up that you can never have for a denominator. Okay? So if, if this were your denominator, you would set it equal to 0 and find out that x can never equal a negative 1 or a positive 1. And if this were your denominator... Um, X could never equal a negative 3. So um, you just got those limits that play a role in it once you get to that point. Okay. So are we good on getting that written down? I know I put my calculator right in the way again, but um, hopefully you're good. And you can always pause it if you're watching it um, and write them down at that point too. Okay. So um, if we have these type of things, I don't know. Do we need to do more, or you guys think you're okay? These are just combining and putting these things together. If we're going to add the two together, um, this one would just simply become x squared um, plus 2x plus 1, because I'm just putting them together. This one, I'm subtracting them, so it's going to be the cube root of x plus 5 minus 2x. So pretty straightforward and simple stuff. And this one is multiplication down here. So you would foil this guy. So if you're going to do this one, 
So x squared times 4 is 4x squared. x squared times an x squared is a minus x to the fourth. 5 times 4 is plus 20. And 5 times a negative x squared is a negative 5x squared. So it does come out kind of strange looking. Um, so my final answer would be negative x to the fourth minus an x squared plus 20 if you're multiplying it. But again, I think we're good because, again, it's just the simple math and just follow what it's asking you to do. So whether you're adding, whether you're subtracting, or whether you're multiplying um, within those. And let me stick this guy up here because it's practice ones. And um, again, I will put all those in there. I had worked them out. So if you're watching the tape, you can go through and um, watch those two pieces and then see what, what happens with them. And then let me flip it here. More practice. So they, again, state the domains. So domains, again, if you're adding, I got to work with this piece. So that piece is going to limit my domain within this one. This one is asking you to combine your pieces together like we did and um, graph the sum of the two functions. So you're just looking for the points that would come out of that one. So here's the answers worked out. So I'll leave those up for a second. Again, stop it if you need to see them. I think we're okay, aren't we? Is what we're going to do with this? I hope so. And then um, this is the second set that are there. Make sure I get it all on there. <clears throat> and then this is the back part. So it would end up graphing those and coming up with where they would show up. Um, in Hawks, if it asks you to graph it, it will probably put the point in for you um, within those. Or you might have to stick it in there, depending on what it's asking you to do. And then finally, that's the written out answers um, that they had with this. Okay? What do you think? Okay, some head shaking out there, yes, so I think we might be okay with that part. All right, let's, um, I don't know, you guys need a break? Okay, let's take a break and uh, come back and we'll...
Okay, looks like everybody's back. So let's go through and finish up the stuff for today. So 11.2 is still working with functions. We're still doing the function stuff. And we're going through and making sure that we still have those. We're going to look at composition of those. So we're going to stick them together in a different way than the way we've added, subtracted, multiplied, and divide before. We're going to stick them inside of each other. So I always say it's kind of like the pretzel getting inside of the M&M. You guys remember the commercials? Quite a while back there was commercials about the pretzel and the M&M and getting inside and the pretzel says, I don't want to get inside of that M&M. And the M&M says, I don't want you inside of me. But we're going to do that same kind of thing when we look at functions. So we're going to take one and stick it inside of the other one and um, see what comes out of it. Then we're going to do inverse functions. And inverse functions sets us up for logarithms because we have to have a way of knowing that if something is the inverse of what it is, that it's still going to end up comparing and coming together with those. If you look at your instruction part in your Hawks piece, it has extra stuff in it that we are not going to do. So just so you're aware of that. So if you go back and say, oh, I'm going to look at my instruction piece, um, to go with this, you're going to find some stuff that we're not going to have to do um, within that. So just so you're aware of that, that, that we kind of cut some different things out of this section so we're not getting into it as heavy duty as maybe what Hawks does um, within their section. So just be aware of that. So the objectives, uh, we're going to form uh, compositions of two of these, very func or these two functions together. Determine the function is in one-to-one -one using the horizontal line test. We're going to show that two functions are the inverse. Um, this one, we're not going to do. We're going to hold off on that one and, and not end up doing that piece. Um, we're going to find the inverse of a one-to-one -one function, and we are going to see what the inverses uh, do over the reflection. This, I'm just going to show you. You are not going to have to do this piece. Okay, so I'll just show it to you so you have one example of what takes place and what it looks like when you get um, the reflection of what takes place with those, but we're not going to have you do that for homework assignment. So again, this section's got a little bit more limitations on it. So do be aware, if you go into instruction within Hawks, it's going to have extra stuff in it. So just so you know that part, um, and so you're aware of it. So a composition, what in the world is it? So it says for two functions, f and g, the composite function, composite function, you're going to see this. And you could look at it and say, oh, it looks like fog. And you could say it's fog if you want to. But what it means is you're going to see these two pieces interchanged. Hawks refers to it in both methods. They refer to it in this method. And what this means is you're going to put G inside of F. So G inside of F. So if you look at this piece right here, and if this were x, if that were f of x, what I'm basically doing is taking the x value that's in my function of f and replacing it with what g of x happens to equal. So I'm pulling x out, putting the whole g of x, whatever it happens to be, in place of that x, and then coming up with what its value would be. Then we would go back and take a look and say the domain. So is my domain limited by anything? So if we end up with radicals in there, we have to be careful and make sure that those don't come out to be negatives. And if we um, have denominators, we got to make sure that our denominator never comes out to be zero. So those are kind of our limits on our domain. So we got to be real careful um, with those pieces and making sure that, that we pay attention to those. So here's our first one. So what we're going to look at with this thing is we're going to say, okay, how can I put this stuff together? So if it says F O G means I'm going to put G in place of X inside my F. If it's G of F or Goff, if you want to look at it that way too, I'm going to put F inside of G where X is at. Okay, so what would this look like? So if I did f of g of x, and remember that is the same as f, that's the exact same as this, so it means the exact same thing. So what it means is I'm going to take f, wherever I have an x, I'm going to stuff g in its place. 
So that's what it's asking me to do. So I'm going to stick G in its place, and then I just have to do the algebra that's connected with it to solve it. So what's it going to equal? So 5 times 3x is 15x. 5 times a negative 7, negative 35, plus 2. So I end up with 15x minus 33. We all good? So once I replace it, I'm good at wherever it happens to be. Now, if f of x here had two pieces and had x's in it, I would still do the same thing. So I'd just take g of x and stick it inside of it. <clears throat> so then if I go and I take a look at the next one over here, and I'm going to stick f inside of it, or I'm going to have um, g o f for x. <clears throat> So what this means is to pay attention to your directions. It means I take G, this piece, and I'm going to take this X out, and I'm going to put 5X in its place. So 3 times 5X plus 2 <clears throat> minus 7. So 3 times 5X is 15X. 3 times 2 is 6. <clears throat> so I'm left with 15X minus 1, and that would be my solution to it okay so not difficult are my domains okay in here sure my domains are perfect okay now if these were in what was called one-to-one -one correspondence or one-to-one -one relationships with each other and I did this with them these two pieces would be identical to each other <clears throat> this one isn't these are kind of like the ones we did earlier where if we graph this and we graph that and we added them together, we'd end up with something completely different. So um, we've got a combination here where they're not coming out the same. Okay, So just be aware of that, that <clears throat> it doesn't work that way. Now, in your homework, <clears throat> it will only ask you for one of these. <clears throat> it will not ask for both. So it's going to be one or the other that you'll end up doing. So it won't be both of them. So what do you think of that part? Is that okay so far? Okay. Now... As our functions change, our method, of course, we use to fix these things also changes. So this one, my f of x is a radical. This one is a parabola or a, um, a quadratic equation. So when I plug this together, so if I say f of g at x, that means I'm going to take what this is and I'm going to stick it in where x is at. So now I have the square root of x squared plus 4 minus 3. Or I have the square root of x squared plus 1. Now I cannot do anything else with it, but what has it done to my domain? Well, now my domain's limited. Okay? Um, because if I look under here, I have to be really careful of what I put in there. So if I take this piece out, set it to be greater than or equal to zero, and what do I find? I get two imaginary numbers. So can I come up with imaginary numbers if I plug stuff in? <clears throat> no. So this domain's not going to be limited at all because x is going to be equal to a plus or minus i. <clears throat> and since it's imaginary, I'm going to be able to stick all kinds of things in here. Also, what lets me put all kinds of things in there is that it's squared. If I square a negative, I get a positive. So this piece will never, ever come out negative under there. Oh, I got what? Oh, plus 1? If I put this together... I'm going to have x squared plus 4 minus 3. So all I did was combine like terms. <clears throat> so the x squared stays, but 4 plus 4 and a negative 3 gives me a positive 1. Okay, that's how. Does that make sense now? Okay, good. So, yep, that's the key there. And then if I go back and do the second one, and we'll use that different color for this one, if I do g of f at x, which is the exact same as g 
that of x. So either way you look at this, it's the exact same thing. So I want to stress that, that when you see either one of those, they match each other. And so if I do this one, that means I'm going to take this piece and I'm going to stick that in its place. So I'm going to have the square root of x minus 3 squared plus 4. Now see how that changed? So if I square a square root, what happens to it? Back to old chapter 9. Chapter 9 is kind of everywhere. Um, <clears throat> it never goes away. So squaring a square root takes care of the square root sign. So I have x minus 3 plus 4. So I simply have x plus 1. And so that becomes my solution there. So any way you look at these, if you're plugging it in and replacing it, remember it only replaces x. So that's what happens with that. Questions with this piece? And knowing where stuff goes and what we do with them. So again, be careful of what's asking you to do. Is there a limitation on my domain with this thing? No, because x plus 1, I can plug anything in for x. It just creates a straight line. So therefore, um, it's good to go. And uh, one more. They're giving you the other way of looking at these, but it still means the exact same thing. So this means I will replace x with 2x minus 5. So if I'm doing f, that one, I'm going to replace this x here with that whole thing. So I'll have 2 <clears throat> times the square root of x plus 3 minus 5. And that one, I can't combine anything with it. So there's no pieces I can work with with this one. But this one has limitations. Because this can never be negative, x plus 3 needs to be greater than or equal to 0. So x needs to be greater than or equal to a negative 3 if it asks you about domains. So you've got domains in there. So be careful that you don't get negatives in the spot. And then finally, the last one. <clears throat> And the last one is g f of x. So I'm going to place this inside of, of um, that was this one, wasn't it? Yes, that's this one. That's this one. This one is the g at f of x. This one is f at g of x. <clears throat> so that one is going to replace and put that underneath my radical. So the radical is going to be 2x minus 5 plus 3, or 2x minus 2 <clears throat> would end up being what that one would equal. And it would also be limited because 2x minus 2 needs to be greater than or equal to 0. Divide by 2. <clears throat> so x needs to be greater than 1 um, with that one. <clears throat> mm -hmm. If it's a radical, okay, if it is a denominator, then it's just set equal to 0. And then you find out what it can't be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but if this is always greater than or equal to, which whatever one you happen to have. Okay, um, so we think we're okay with that part and plugging stuff in. Just be really careful, not like me, and put the wrong one in the wrong spot. Um, when you do that one. So one-to-one -one correspondence um, or one-to-one -one functions means that the function is in one-to-one -one function if one-to-one -one function, if, if the value of y in the range, range is your y values, there is only one corresponding value of x in the domain. Meaning that if I had um, 3 comma 4 and 2 comma 5 and um, 4 comma 5, this would not be a function because I've got duplicate fives here. You see that? Way back when in basic algebra, we did a vertical line test. When we looked at parabolas and we did a vertical line test, I guess we kind of did that in here, they crossed at one point. Today, what we're going to add is not only a vertical line test, but we're going to add a horizontal line test to see if we have a function. And this thing fails because there's two points when I do a vertical line or a horizontal line test, and it's got two points all in all kinds of places. Or this one fails because 5 is duplicated, so this is not in one 
to 1. So that's not, and this one is not either. <clears throat> so it's going to ask you whether it's a one-to-one -one function or whether it's not one um, when you look at it. Now the ones that you're going to see are going to be, again, horizontal line tests. We drop a horizontal line to see if the function um, is more than one point that's connected with a Y within that. <clears throat> and so let's look at a graph. So this is my graph. So the blue piece in here is the graph of this function. So if I do a horizontal line test, meaning this red da dash line running through here, does it only touch the graph in one point? So if it only touches in one point, then it's in what's considered one-to-one -one, um, correspondence. So if I put another horizontal line in there, notice it also touches in one location. So as soon as it touches in two, you would not have one-to-one. -one. So we would say yes on this one that it is in one-to-one -one, um, correspondence. And in Hawks, it'll say yes or no, and you need to click on whichever one um, that it happens to be. So then if we look at another graph of this one that's plotting points, so if I just plot negative three up four, and I plot negative two up one, and I plot um, zero up at four, and I plot three up at one, and I do my horizontal line test, what happens is it's at two spots. Notice how it's touching here and touching there. Or if you look at your points, four and four are associated with two different X's. So therefore, it's not one-to-one. -one. So not, or you would say no if you were looking at this one as a graph and what you were picking out of it. So if they don't touch or if they touch in two spots, then we have it. Now in our old system, if we did a vertical line test, this would classify in that situation because every X is associated with only one Y, okay? Even though Ys are kind of double dipping in there um, with that one. And then one more, which is a line. And lines or straight lines are always gonna be in one-to-one -one correspondence if we take a look at those. The only ones that are not will be the horizontal lines. The horizontal lines fail um, because if you have a horizontal line, notice if you did a vertical line test, you get a, or a horizontal line test, you get a whole bunch of points that are all on the same line. So it would be no on that one. But any slanted positive or negative slopes is a yes. They're considered to be in one-to-one -one correspondence. What do you think with graphs? I think you got an idea um, with those. Um, and one more, a parabola. And parabolas always fail. Okay? They will always fail. They will never, ever be in one-to-one -one because they're always sharing somebody. And that's because last chapter we learned about the line of symmetry. That's because everything gets duplicated. So if you know this point, you know this one over here because you can just go over two spaces and you've got it. Okay? So if you got a parabola, it's never going to make it. Okay? So it'll always fail. So it'll never be in one-to-one. -one. So this is definitely a no. So we would check and put no down for our solution to that one. So, nope, we won't end up coming up with those. Um, inverses. Inverses. Um, are denoted by the symbol f to the negative first. It's not an exponent, so don't think of it as one. So it's not an exponent, it's just saying that. And basically what happens in a one-to-one -one function with an ordered pair, the opposite or the inverse function is going to just reverse your point values. So if in a regular function, you have 2 comma 4, 3 comma 8, and 7 comma 9. In your inverse function, what's going to happen is your y's will become your x's. And your x's will become your y's and your points. So it basically it just reverses them. So reverses the point. So it's going to flip them around. 
it's going to make them into the opposites of what they are. So, um, so in all of these, y comma x, and all of these are x comma y, and it's just going to flip your pieces so that you get your spots in the different location um, within those. So, um, so that's basically what happens with inverse functions. So if you graphed one and you put in the regular function, so if I go back to my um, y equals here, now, whoops, I don't want those. Um, I'm not going to clear out my three because I might need that in another location, but I am going to clear y1 and I'm going to clear y2. I'm going to just leave y3 just sitting there. You can turn it off if you want, and that just means to get on top of the equals. So over arrow to be on top of the equals and hit enter, and what it will do is turn it off so it doesn't show up. It's just that you got to remember to turn it back on because that was from our previous section. So if we're going to use it, we might want to leave it where it's at. Um, so what happens in an inverse is I can just put in x plus 3. Oops, if I get where I can put it in, x plus 3. If I go to my table, second table, if I want to get its inverse, take your y's, make those your x's, make your x's into your new y's, and you will have the inverse function of that. So if I wanted to invert this one, it would be 2 comma negative 1, 3 comma 0, 4 comma 1, 5 comma 2, 6 comma 3, 7 comma 4. And that would be the inverse, okay? So I would in, get the inverse of it, or the opposite of it, okay? So, um, so if I look at my graph of this one, that's my first graph. So that's coming in as um, the normal graph. To do an inverse of that function, um, and continuing on here, this is just basically saying that it's not an exponent. So just remember that it's not an exponent um, with that. But if you're going to do an inverse, what we will do with an inverse is let y equal f of x. So we're doing the same thing there. Interchange x and y. Step three in the new equation, solve for y in terms of x. And then substitute f of negative one of x for y, and you have your new function. So if I took my function I just put on here, my x plus three, so if f of x is equal to x plus 3, it's f of a negative 1 of x. I'm going to replace and put this as y equals x plus 3. We good there so far? All I did was turn it into an equation I can use on my calculator. Replace x with y. Replace y with x. So all I did was switch these two around and solve for y. And I have my inverse function. So my inverse function is x minus 3. So if I stick it in my calculator, go down to my y2 and put x minus 3. What's going to happen when I graph it is I still get that one and I get its inverse. Um, and its inverse didn't change much. It just moved it down because my slope didn't change. Um, my slope still stayed the same. But if I look at my chart or my table, um, I ended up getting my differences in here. Now, they're hard to see. Now, remember I said we're going to take 2 and put a negative 1. If I go down here at 2, notice it's at a negative 1. You've got to find them sometimes within your graph of where they happen to be. But it's switching your orders and switching your spots and switching your stuff around, okay? So we're going to do some more of those so we can get some ideas of switching stuff. Now, this is the one piece I was going to show you. Now, we are not going to um, end up doing such things as this. This is just kind of giving us an idea of what would happen. This line is where a mirror would go if you're looking at a mirror image. And notice the points are reversed. Zero, negative, or zero, five, seven fifths, 
7 fifths, 0. Negative 7, 0 reverses to 0, negative 7. And that's going to be the inverse piece of this thing. So our blue line right here, that blue line, is this function. And so if I get its inverse to find the red line, I need to take this piece and reverse it. So if I reverse that, x is going to become my y. My x will become on this side my y and solve for y. Divide by 5. And I find out y is equal to x plus 7 over 5, which is my new line. And if I reverse that and come up and put it in there, so f of a negative 1 of x is x plus 7 all over 5. And if I graph it, that's this line. And I end up, or the red line is this one, the blue line is that one. And so I get my combinations of what I happen to have in there, okay? So, again, you're not asked to do this piece. It's just showing you and giving you an idea of um, what stuff is in there and how that comes out. Okay, so let's reverse another one. What happens with this guy if I do the inverse of it? And, again, we're not going to graph them. We are only going to look at them as doing inverses. So this becomes y, g of x becomes y, 6x plus 2. So I first have to get it into a graphable piece. Then if I do my inverse, my inverse says y becomes x, x becomes y, and then I need to solve for y. So first off, I need to... Um, move my 2 over, how do I get a y out of a denominator? What would I have to do? So that ends up being a little bit different. So how do I get a y out of a denominator? It's been a while since we did one of these. So multiply the whole thing by y. So I get y times x minus 2. These two cancel. Then all I have left to do is divide by an x minus 2. And then if it asks me about domains, my domain becomes limited now because I've got a denominator. And so my domain can never equal 2. So it would never show up as a 2 in there okay? Um, when you're working with this one. So again, if you graphed it, you would see a pattern in there and a picture of what happens. You will see these on your homework. So these pop up a bit in there of seeing that kind of pattern. Okay? So what do you think? Can you do those? Try this one. I'm going to do an inverse of this guy. Don't forget to first change it so you know where your x is going and you know where your y is going <clears throat> when you get your inverse. So that becomes my inverse. So g at a negative 1 of x is equal to x minus 2 over 3. So it will be its inverse. Okay? <clears throat> what do you think? Handle that? So we stuffed them inside and we, whoops, you need it back? Are you done, Brian? 
Okay. Um, so last one. See what you can do with that one. And again, these kind of are the ones that bounce back and forth in your homework section. Um, so we've stuffed them inside of each other. We've worked with knowing whether they're inverses or not. Um, and we looked at graphs. We looked at horizontal lines and that type of stuff. And then we finish up taking these things and and figuring them out and going from there to solve it. So, always make sure that you do that piece first, that you rewrite it so that you know when you do your inverse where your x is going and where your y goes. So. Don't multiply everything by y first, okay? Get your 5 over. If you multiply everything by y first, it gets really ugly, okay? So, uh, and then you've got to factor it back out again. So don't do it at that point. Do it right at this location. And then divide off your x plus 5. And if it does ask for domain, <coughs> x could never, ever, ever equal a negative 5. Okay? So we can't ever have a negative 5 in there. All right. Need another one of those? You're good. Think you're good? Okay. I hope you're good. So um, this one, I don't have any practice pieces to it. So um, that's where we're going to end at with those. There are other ones, of course, you can take a look at with stuff in your book um, also. Uh, but again, the exercises with this one go a little bit beyond what we did today. So if you're going to the instruction, realize that, that it might have more stuff, and I know it does, um, have more stuff to it than what we went over. So, okay, questions? All right, let me shut this guy off. No, we do not.